This is George Dion for Metal Express Radio, and I'm here with the guitarist and founder of Annihilator, Jeff Waters. If I knew absolutely nothing about Annihilator, how would you describe the band's music to me? Oh, just cross between thrash metal, heavy metal, all different kinds. You know, it's a bit of hard rock, a bit of punk, a bit of love songs, a bit of hate songs, fast, slow, a bit of prog, a bit of technical, a bit of speed, a bit of simplicity. A lot of different styles in one and not, you know, except for maybe our first couple of records, no, nothing uh, groundbreaking in a new sound. Like, you know, when a Pantera came out or when some of these bands came out, it was never to me. Um, yeah, I remember like ACDC Slayer Pantera, all these, they always had this one sound they would go for. And and it was a smart idea because it meant you had a style that people would recognize. And, you know, you, you play the first to the last ACDC record. Same with Pantera, same with, uh, you know, Slayer. You 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 hear it's the same band. You know it. It's the same style, just different, you know, songwriting over the decades. But for me, I always knew that was going to be the, the keeping the same lineups, the same singers, zeroing in on a style. Like, you know, I remember touring with Pantera on this Painkiller tour in 91 in Europe. And they were the opening band. They played like 30 minutes and we got like 45 minutes because we'd already had two big albums out, you know, Never Neverland and Allison Hill. Uh, and they were kind of the unknown band until a year later. And um, I remember listening to, uh, we shared the bus with them, which was one huge party. And the back lounge, I remember listening from my bunk to them having a meeting and they really were smart and targeted exact. Well, we knew from power metal when you saw the album cover versus what happened with Cowboys from hell and on, you knew there was a planned strategy going on. That wasn't an accident. I mean, you know, the hair and the wigs and, and then bang, they're the toughest, most badass band in, in metal history. But they, they, um, they, for example, they planned this. They, you know, I remember Phil telling me, he was the guy I would always hang out with. He would always tell me things like, yeah, you know, Mike Patton, Henry Rollins, that kind of thing. That was my shtick. And then Vinny had the sort of Lars Ulrich, you know, one or two pieces of his drum kit would be Lars Ulrich pulled from an album. Uh, Dime, of course, I mean, me and him were perfect for each other guitar wise because we liked the same guitar player, Randy Rhodes, Eddie Van Halen, you know, so it was like. Um, so it was kind of like, you know, Dime zeroed in on his big repertoire metal playing but he zoomed it in to the the whammy bars and the noises of the van halen and then he had his you know randy rhodes and a couple other ones but they kept their stuff very focused and they had a plan and i i did the opposite i i made sure that almost every record sounded different good or bad uh some singers people like some people didn't um Sometimes I didn't get the right musician. Sometimes I messed up the production or sometimes I would do this or my writing was a little too copied from other bands or copying my previous work. There's all this up and downs going on, but it was basically Annihilator, except for the first two records, have just settled into being uh, all those heavy metal influences and thrash metal influences and hard rock that I liked when I was younger. Um, the ones that would fit Annihilator, so to speak, uh, in you know, from classical guitar to a bluesy thing, to a jazzy thing, to anything, I would fit that in. And, you know, that was, in one sense, that was a stupid idea if you wanted to get rich and famous. Um, in the other, the other side, and managers and labels would tell me it all the time. And I was like, well, as long as I can pay my rent and I had enough money to buy a Camaro and eat and go out on a date with a girl and, and feed myself at a nice restaurant once a month, as long as I could pay for it all and survive and enjoy and have fun, I wasn't in it for that. I was, I love the attention and the, the touring and everything. It's amazing. But as a fan too, but it wasn't about, you know, being a star and being totally known and famous and all that. And even money, uh, money came later. Um, but it was, it was really, you know, just about having fun. So I, I never cared much about the image or keeping the singers or keeping the band members. And I would even tr turn uh, turn over musicians every couple of album, every album or two, simply because something different to try for the hell of it. Not not to sell records, but just to have fun with it. Um, so yeah, if you like heavy metal and thrash metal, you'll you'll find some Annihilator CDs and some songs that you'll like 
Maybe some you'll love, some you just totally won't want to hear. Um, but that's, I think, why we're still around is because, you know, when I talk to fans and, you know, I've done a lot of touring for quite a while. When I talk to fans after 17 studio records, it always comes back to, I like that album. I like that singer. I like it when you do this. I like it when you that. I don't like it this. I don't like that. And you realize they might not like a couple of records, but they, they are coming back if you're going to do good work and maybe you make a singer change or maybe you do better. Maybe you have a better songs. Maybe you have a better sound on a record. They're always kicking around there and coming back. So that's the bonus for this is, is as you, you know, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of bands that have, have had long careers, but most of them don't, especially in metal. They're not around 30, 35 years. I think that's the reason why is because we, we hit pretty big for the first four records. And then we kind of leveled off, went down and leveled off, um, slowly rising up in the last eight years, basically. But I think the reason is because we had, I had this fan base that was like, okay, well, I don't like what he's doing this year, but I'll check out the next one. And they check it out and then they like the next one. So I, I don't know. It's just, it's just a lot of different styles. And, you know, if you're into really solid, heavy music, you're only going to find a few songs that are super heavy from us. I just don't have the ability and I wanted to, you know, write a song as heavy as Pantera, Five Minutes Alone or Slayer, Rain and Blood album or Haunting the Chapel, Chemical Warfare, you know, all that stuff because I'm such a fan, but I couldn't do it. It's not, it's not what I'm made of. I could write a song from The Knack or The Sweet. I could write um, one thing I did for 12 years as I was writing quote, hit songs for uh, pop and country ballads in the USA. So I, I like everything from disco because I grew up listening to I Was Made For Loving You and, and Rod Stewart's If You Want My Body and You Think I'm Sexy and Rolling Stones in the disco era. I was like eight or nine or 10 years old. Right. So I got the whole what I did in my whole career, though, is I actually took one thing that I didn't do. And I maybe did a couple of songs with a little ACDC hint tribute kind of thing. But I didn't put the Van Halen, the ACDC, the White Snake, the. I didn't put that hard rock stuff, 70s and early 80s, in Annihilator. That's the one piece of music I kept out. And um, I'd always thought someday, over those 30, 35 years, someday, if I'm lucky, I'll get to start another band and just do that. So I would write songs for Annihilator's records, and I would just not, it's, that's for my other project someday. So it's been 30-something years since I've been thinking like that. And uh, in the summer of 2023 i'll have my first band out that's not annihilator and it's not heavy metal so uh it's not a project it's not a zoom kind of thing it's an actual band and uh i've kind of retired the pretty much retired the recording part of annihilator i think that's 17 records the last one i did was pretty well received and uh i think it's probably the best i'll get at this stage of my career with writing so many albums so many songs myself um i think for the writing part I think 180 songs is is enough um but w but i have a lot of plans to like the anniversary tour for the first three albums we're going to do with a bunch of the original singers except one randy rampage passed away on the al snail singer Stu block will come along for that one um and you know a catalog tour you know i've done this catalog deal with adel ear music and i promised them after the anniversary thing next year 2023 i would uh regroup and then come back the next year and do a sort of kind of a farewell catalog tour. So I got quite a few years left and a lot of fun with Annihilator to do and a lot of shows. So it should be fun. There's, there's an answer to everyone, every, every question you could ever have. You're absolutely right. I was just going to say that. I love a guy that can do his own interview and I only have to ask one question. Well, well wait, wait, you can, you can just edit all the uh, pretend <laughs> questions in that you were going to ask. <laughs> so you released Metal 2 through ear music. Yeah. It's you, I, you, it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, the constant changes in Annihilator and you also mentioned Pantera. Um, I think with Metal 2, obviously, it's it's sort of a redo of the original release in 2007. You've added Stu Block on vocals and Dave Lombardo on drums. I think Stu sort of has that Pantera sweet spot to his voice there listening to the album. Uh, this is the album you always wanted to redo. Why specifically this one? 
Well, this is the thing. I would never wanted to redo any album, but it was a um, when this pandemic thing hit. It was, uh, you know, I I watched a lot of friends who were not prepared for the world to shut down, who were living, you know, show to show to feed themselves, to pay their rent. To, and then these are people that would even get in magazine covers. Like that, you know, as you probably know, unless you're at the top of this business, you know, or in there a long time with a good business sense and, and clean, sober, blah, 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 and lucky, you know, there's not a lot of money there. And musicians and artists and you know, Hollywood, all, a lot of people are, there's some great business minds and some clean people, but generally you got to be a little bit messed up to be this creative in some way. So uh, a lot of that is just living for today and not thinking much about the future, about something ending. And uh, I watched a lot of well-known people. Uh, some of them I knew, some of them I knew personally, and some of them are good friends. Crash. I mean, and I was thinking, well, I guess I'm okay because financially I've been getting my shit together for about eight or nine years now. Um, and uh, things have been going fantastic. And I I ended up actually helping a few friends out that that were, I mean, Jesus, that you would not think needed help, but some of them were really having problems. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I can isolate here. I've got a little castle for a studio with a, a loft upstairs. If I want to go back to the house or if I'm working late at night, I'll just stay upstairs. And it's like a dream studio that, that we were about to open in March of 2020. Um, but uh, so we got this incredible place to myself. Um, but I was staying, I was not hockey or anything, but I was kind of like, Okay, well, if we're going to lock down here for a little while, whatever it is, a month or a year or six months, I'm in a perfect place to do it. And my family is. And then, wham, I got, and I, I watched a lot of my friends have some real mental health struggles really quickly. Like they, they were not ready for this. They, the tours were getting canceled and they would, they would start thinking they could rebook them for three months later. I was like, no, no, you can't. And promoter friends of mine that had festivals and club owners here in, in England, even people were in big trouble and therefore, you know, marriages were in trouble. Any addictions would likely get worse. Domestic stuff, abuse went up everywhere. You know, the whole steamroller events that happen, people losing their jobs or businesses. Um, I thought I was doing okay. Like uh, until I caught COVID <laughs> and that we all got it. And I got the first round of it and uh, I'm an ex smoker. And, you know, I might appear healthy sometimes on tours, you know, when you cut the sleeves off your shirt and you flex your muscle and make it look like you got more muscle than, than you really do. And, um, you know, and of course, you, you know, in the music business, you can take, you can put upload pictures to your website where you look better than worse. Right. So <laughs> I'd, I'd always thought, well, it's not about image, but I don't want to put out an image of when I'm finished my album and my tours and I've just eaten pizza five nights a week for six months doing the next album. And now I just gained about 15 or 10, 10 kilograms. Right. So, you know, people thought I was pretty damn healthy, but you know, I wasn't, I don't drink for decades and it didn't matter. I got hit with that first one. And it was like, um, somebody sitting on your chest for two weeks. And it was like, Whenever you breathe, breathe in or out, it was like a crackling fire. It was that bad. And I was pretty, my oxygen level was so low that it was like, well, we could put you in the hospital and give you the tube down your throat to breathe. And that scared the shit out of me. Um, and I got very lucky because, you know, I, I should have actually went into the hospital for that. But I turned around and came back and said, no, I'll, I'll have my wife watch me. And uh, I got through it. No, no medicines. Nobody knew about medicine. Even, um, you know, those asthma allergy things, puffers, they call them that, you know, if you have an al allergy to cats like I do yeah. or um, seasonal allergies. Well, I had one of those because I badly allergic to cats and I was going to take it. But of course, the media tells you, oh, no, you can't use those things to clear your lungs up because it could make it worse. So um, I, I got through it without anything no doctor no medicine nothing i just but it was close man i didn't realize how devastating that covid thing was the early one um obviously when we get to the end of it this omicron thing obviously that's not as, as severe as the beginning of it but i mean 
it's not killing everybody like the first ones did. Well, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Jeff, I'm actually still recovering from Omicron. <laughs> I was in the hospital for 14 days and then I was on home <laughs> oxygen for a month. I still have it. My lungs are still trying to come back. So <laughs> Omicron is bad. Yeah. I mean, is that the one you had? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had, yeah, I had the first one and it was the same thing. I was just like, okay, I can't breathe. <laughs> and I just living, uh, you know this, but you were in the hospital for it. Um, my thing was I was literally living every, every like morning, afternoon and night. If I, if it was nighttime, I'd be like, okay, just get through the night. Right. And see if you can sleep and get through the night and you wake up and you can't breathe. You got to call the wife. Cause I'd stay in another room to isolate and all that stuff. It was living, uh, you know, thirds of the days, right. The morning, afternoon and nighttime. And, and you just try to get through one and get through the next and get, so it, yeah, that, as you know, that sucked. Um, after that, I just came out of this and, you know, it, it broke in about 12 days, I think, where it, it no longer felt like someone. My thing was somebody was sitting on my chest. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have a cough. And I had this. Remember, this was like uh, this is April 2020. Nobody knew about uh, the taste or the smell change. Nobody knew about that. It was not on the table. It was always about a fever and a cough. and. Um, I, I thought, well, I don't have any of those symptoms. All I've got is this lung thing. Um, but I, I realized real quick, I couldn't taste or smell anything. I was eating hot sauce. I was doing everything to, to try to, to taste something. And I was just kept looking online to see if there, that was a symptom. Nope, nobody said anything. So I thought, oh, that's weird. I guess this COVID thing must have destroyed my sense of taste and smell. I hope it's not permanent. But it took me six, no, seven to eight months before I woke up about seven, eight months after I got it, so 12, 12 days after I got it, it felt like the elephant stopped sitting on my chest and I knew, okay, I'm getting better. But it took about seven months or so before I, I could take a full breath in. I, I thought it damaged my lungs from this and it was permanent and I didn't want to go to the hospital because here in England, they were telling you, you can't even leave your place and you can't go to the hospital because it's too full. And I thought, well, I survived it. I guess I got permanent lung damage. Uh, wasn't funny, but after, I'll never forget, about seven months in after it, I, I woke up one morning, it was early January or something, and I woke up and went, whoa, I could actually take a full breath in. And then, so now it's been, you know, a year and something since then, uh, I got the full thing back. But uh, that, right after those two weeks of the first two weeks in, in April 2020, uh, before you heard about Coverdale and, and, uh, David Coverdale and, um, CZ top, or I'm just trying to think of, you know, Springsteen and all these other artists selling their catalogs or publishing or their ownership or their trademarks. I woke up from that 12 day COVID hell that I had. And I said, fuck this. I'm going to take care of my, uh, what are the things I need to take care of if I drop dead tomorrow? And one was, you know, do, do my kids and family know I love them? Yep. Number two. Financially, is everybody okay? Yep. Okay, number three, my little, you know, everybody's got a legacy. You, me, everybody's got some kind of legacy. My little legacy would be my band thing that I've been doing since I was a teenager. And is that house in order? Is that? And I was like, oh, shit, not at all. So I had albums scattered around the world with different companies that were not out anywhere, not on Spotify or iTunes. I had records that were still illegally being made and sold when the contracts ended a decade ago, I had all this mess and I, I was to blame for it. So I, I got it all in order. I spent uh, three months in this, in my studio, getting the masters back and, you know, not the original tape masters from the early days, but, you know, as much as I could get and just relaxed during this lockdown. And after get, getting over it um, and putting together literally my little legacy of 22 titles that I got. Um, and I sold it. I sold them to a German company, Adel, which is has the, the music arm is ear music. And they essentially said, OK, once you sell this stuff, when it's sold, you, you know, depending on the deal. But usually when it's sold, it's sold. You say goodbye. You have no rights at all unless they use it for I think in the clause, it's anything to do with like racism or Nazi or child pornography or murders or, or things like horrible, horrible things. 
they you have no recourse against them to use your music. You probably put a, a, a cat on my head and put it on the cover of one of the records and reissue it. So the rights are all gone. A week later, the boss of the company calls back and says, now that we got the, the you've got the money and you've given us all the masters and all the bonus things, uh, we need a favor. And I said, sure, what do you need? Well, we need you to help us promote it or to announce that the catalog's coming out because it's a lot of titles over two years. And uh, I said, sure, what do you want? Like, I'll help, no problem. And the gimmick, the idea, the idea promotion something is simply was just something that we that they could say when they announced oh we got annihilators catalog over the next two years we're going to be reissuing better quality versions and you know all the bonus stuff um but what's something that could kick it off and get a few people talking i said well there's not a lot you can do you can pour money in but annihilators not the annihilators catalog is not the most sought after kind of music in the world right now um so they basically said uh, think of something and and they'll pay for it. And I thought, okay, if they're paying, I'll think of something. So I thought one of the records uh, that I wish I could have redone because the three main people, myself, Mike Mangini, people know him from Steve I, Extreme Annihilator, now Dream, Dream Theater. Um, Dave Padden has been my, was my singer for 11 years and played guitar live too, on tour. Uh, so the three of us were the main people on that record in 2007 called Metal. And all three of us were distracted and just didn't focus. We all kind of seemed to get together to do the record and our minds were completely on other things and things were rushed and not managed properly by me. And uh, I was trying to get the rights from 12 other artists and their managers and labels to even get their, their, their guest performances on the record. So when you're dealing with one or two guests, that's okay. But when you get 12 that are signed, a lot of them are signed to major labels. Uh, there was some people asking labels asking for like twenty thousand dollars for somebody's fucking twenty second solo, and I was like, "You got to be joking, right?" Um, and an aside to that is everybody on that that original album, the album, even the Metal Two one, uh, I didn't pay one of those artists one single euro or penny or whatever you want to call it, one dollar. They all went to their managers and labels and said, "Listen, stop being jerks." Just let me play on this thing. It's not Metallica's new album. It's a band called Annihilator, and they, they'd love to get me playing on it. So every one of those guests on here, except for Stu and Dave Lombardo, um, weren't even paid for it. They did. They they stood up and said, you know what? We want to we want to do our little guest spot. So they're, they're all awesome. Um, and that was it. It was like a gimmick, something kind of interesting to say, along with announcing the catalog, put out this metal two version. Um, it's the original is usually the better in most things. And the point of this was to release both of them and not to compete because the original is fine for what it is. And so is the new one, the new one's actually raw, quick, fun, uh, zero input from me I told Stu and Dave Lombardo or Stu Block, Dave Lombardo, just do whatever you guys want to do to it. So therefore you got Stu a couple of songs. He had no clue. He was lost in a lot of it because well, what voice do I use? Like a priest or a Phil Anselmo? I go do a stew block. But he he wasn't, we didn't have, each guy had three takes, three tries. So I picked the best versions. And I refused to give him any input. I said, I don't care what you do. Just do what you're going to do. That's the fun of it. And uh, so that's it. You got legends like Stu and Dave doing doing a very quick recording, only three tries at it. Versus a studio album with the great Mike Mangini and Dave Padden on it. I mean, completely different albums. That's why we'll release both of them and people can like either one or both. But yeah. anyway, I'll let you speak for a second. So this is part of a re-release campaign through Ear Music, as you mentioned. Uh, you couldn't get all the albums, so I'd ask which ones you couldn't get, but I'd actually guess probably the, the early albums, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Our quote big ones were the first four, and the fourth one, King of the Kill. Of course, I got back, but the first three, you're right. Uh, two were on Roadrunner, and the third was on Sony. And those were the deals. And I won't say in the old days because they still happen today. They happen absolutely today. That majority of these deals, um, they they were they call them ownership deals, where the the label owns all the rights to the masters, and you don't you don't have any rights to it. And um, which is 
fine. That's a typical record deal. That's the big deal, right? Um, they'll give you as much money as they can to go and get a crappy tour bus, get in just enough crew. They'll send you on the road for two years to support your album, even if it means playing the USA four times in two years on package tours that you might not make any money or get any good treatment on. Um, but you have a chance at your band being famous. You'll probably get on covers of magazines and you'll probably get do a lot of big press and stuff. But when it comes to your getting paid for your actual work that you're doing that it's just so rare in the music business that anybody would make anything um, on those deals. I got lucky in that my deal at that time was similar to most everyone else's. And that was like a five or seven album deal. I think mine was a seven album deal, the Roadrunner seven albums that that would be like a 20 year thing right <laughs> um and when we were dropped in 93 i remember the a and r guy boldly saying unless you want to cut your hair or or sorry what was yeah chain image play music like biohazard sepultura or pantera sorry we're gonna have to let you go we're letting most of our bands go anyway anything with the word heavy metal in the bio was usually dumped in 93 um even you saw Judas Priest and Slayer and, and bands like that downgrading venue sizes and changing singers with, you know, Rip Rowans came into Priest. I mean, I saw Priest and Slayer in the big Vancouver arenas for years and wham, this whole thing hits. And you've got Priest in a, in a club, 86th Street Music Hall in Vancouver, and you've got Slayer in a club, the Commodore Ballroom. Now, these guys were headlining the arenas and selling them out just a few years earlier. so. We're, you know, got cleaned right out. Most of the metal stuff, traditional stuff got thrown right out there and up the big guys. And I was so lucky because if they'd not dropped me, I would have been had to been stuck in a contract that would have lasted for <laughs> like 20 years if I was able to survive that long. So uh, that was it turned out. I thought it was the worst thing ever for me. But immediately. a. a British and Japanese companies and publishing companies literally lined up to sign us. So it hadn't, our kind of, our kind of music hadn't died in 93. It was still going an extra year or two. And, um, I ended up with the biggest deal that I'd ever had in my life with any companies were in that period where I got dropped from Roadrunner. I literally signed, I bought a house recording studio and two cars. I mean, and that, that was the beginning of how I was able to have my own studio and realize that what a gift that was, that I could do deals with labels, take the money to record the album, but I already owned a studio, so I didn't have to pay anyone. That was basically my living money. And then I figured out, okay, you don't do the ownership deals, you do these license deals. And that's when I started to become a mini businessman and figure it all out. But, uh, they had the first three albums. They won't let it go. I tried to buy that off the label that owns it now. It's called Rhino. Uh, I don't, they, I think from what I hear from lawyers and that is you almost can't buy this stuff back because the value and worth of the company itself is more if they own stuff versus if they, 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 you know, it seems like they'd rather keep it sitting there. Nobody ever hears about these albums ever never gets reissued um they'd rather keep it there than sell it for good money uh because i guess it means the company's worth more if they own it but uh i've tried to buy those back believe me <laughs> offered stupid money too even sometimes i didn't even have the money i was throwing offers up but um yeah no i guess that's it um the only good news i guess for that would be the label that did buy the 22 titles is talking to that company now to see if they can sublicense it out, which means I could get involved in re-releases and uh, and it could possibly like I've got a stack of stuff in here from those old days, audio recordings and things, but I'm not allowed to use it because they they own it. Who knows? In other words, one I I kind of figured I'm not going to wait around to see if they're going to do anything with the albums, which they won't, and I can't buy them back. So oh well. Um, what I could do is get some of the original people back and do some killer shows with these guys if they're healthy enough. So uh, we'll see. With the new reissues, are you going to touch them up kind of like Megadeth did with their remix and remasters through Capital? 
well, I'm trying, but I don't have the, you know, we weren't the, the sort of Pantera smart band that, that carried video cameras around on their early tours and thus came out with the first platinum selling VHS releases with the vulgar videos. And, you know, those with those, we, we didn't even film anything in the early days. And I never given a shit about much about image or, or recording stuff or stockpiling stuff for future. I was like, I don't care. It's a past. I, I kind of always look like a lot of people, you know, from a business standpoint, it was stupid because I could have stockpiled a lot of cool stuff, but um, just didn't have the inclination. I didn't care. It was like, it's not about what I did or what I'm doing. It's about, you know, it's what I'm doing now. Right. That was kind of how I would always think. So I wouldn't even care that I did Alice in Hell or Never Neverland. I, I love the experiences that that gave me. But as soon as the album was done, it was forgotten. Like we're talking about metal too. Holy cow. If you want to hear forgotten, I did that one in 2006. Um, the new one was done last year and I forgot all about that album. It, the label just told me last month, Hey, your album's coming out. I go, what album? And it, Oh, that one, you know? So that's kind of how, you know, you, you can't dwell on your past stuff. You sit there and you, you get nothing done. Right. So, I don't even know what I'm babbling about right now, so put me on track. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about touching up the albums, like remixing them and remastering. Yeah, I got some. I, I've been able to pick different mixes and reorder the albums. And I, you know, a big part of the deal I did with this year music company was, you know, well, three things. One was money, so that worked out great. Um, number two was make it available for uh, on all formats. For the future so it has to be available everywhere and always there even if people don't want to buy it it's got to be at least available and and then i the, the last thing was i needed to uh i told them straight out i said i i have new mixes i've remastered the stuff so it sounds better some are remixed but most of it's just remastering um you can have access of course directly to the artist that, that did most of those records and you know he revamped the metal too one up and did some nice shirts for us and but he's willing to go along with the catalog stuff and change the art and do different things and booklets but i said you know the third stipulation or requirement is you guys gotta agree to like giving it all for content because i don't have that much content so the cool part of that is the label is going to be offering cool formats and just sort of new things that aren't out yet as far as how they deliver the products and stuff so and, you know, it's, I'll be, you know, I just gave away a guitar, but I mean, everybody does that too, right? But I'm going to try to do some really fun things with it. It's kind of neat for me because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. I don't own it. But <laughs> they, they, they come to me and, for example, they said, hey, we want to give a guitar away. I go, well, I've got lots of guitars in, in the house and in the storage space and, and quite actually quite a few in the studio, but they're the studio ones. Um, can you give a guitar away? And I was like, well, yeah, but, you know, why should I? give my guitar away for your deal kind of thing. And I don't mind, but you know, and they're like, Oh no, here, we'll write you a check and we just find a good guitar and, and something special about it. And we'll write you a check for the guitar. And I'm just sitting here going, hang on a minute. I've got hundreds of guitars. So if I want to sell the ones that I don't really care much about, the label's going to buy it and offer it personalized. And they'll buy it for me to give free to fans to promote the catalog. And I'm like, I win. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we're, we're, it's going to be a lot of special stuff. And plus I've even told them, I mean, not a legal promise, but I told them after this anniversary, 30th, 31st, 33rd, whatever it is of our first three records, after that tour is done, hopefully it's starting in 2023. Um, when that's finished, I'll take a short break and I'll hit back again. And Again, like you said, those are the, for the first three albums that this, this label doesn't have. But everything after that, they have. And I said, I'll go out and do a tour where you can literally bring your own merch person and sell all your catalog and even stuff from your other ear music stuff, whatever. You pay for it. You bring them all along and they can use our venues and our, our merch booths and sell your products. And, and we'll promote it as a catalog tour as well as maybe a farewell thing. So I'm going to work and. You know, it's my mini legacy too, even though it's sold. 
it's it's a it's good for me to go out there and promote it. And it's also good because most of that stuff, most people haven't heard in, in metal business, haven't had access to even. So this is kind of cool that I can, you know, show them, hey, and, and go out, hey, there's some good stuff in there, find it. <laughs> like, you know, find out some of the records that you like. See what you can. It's good. It's based around touring and having fun over here. So it's going to be a blast. So for the future, you've got the, the possible legacy tour that you're going to do in 2023. You got this mystery project in 2023. What else you got on the burner? It's not a project. It's a band. It's a band. But yeah. Yeah. No, that's the thing is, it, think about it. Everything you and I have been seeing online, especially last year and before, it was all about musicians trying to network, trying to survive, trying to keep their popularity going, trying to keep their stats up online about, oh, can I make money off these online ideas? Because I got to make something. I can't pay the bill. So, I mean, and then there was that big rush where everybody was trying to do a live stream. And I even got caught up in that thinking maybe I should do that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, people want to see bands now. Uh, I know a lot of musicians that I know had been in the last couple of years scrambling to record music. And sometimes it's being done cheaper than normal because the labels are not functioning the same as they were. Uh, people can't fly to the other country to go into a studio or to write together or so they're done long distance. And of course, we got all these, you know, all these stars on the Zoom thing doing cover songs. I, I kind of I stayed away from that, but because I was working on my thing here. But um, what I what I did is I, I said, okay, I'm a, I'm a like people know I'm like a late seventies, you know, mid seventies to early eighties heavy metal fan. So seventies and early eighties, which takes you the first Van Halen out, first six Van Halen albums takes you. A bit to ACDC takes me the first, you know, Love Gun all the way up to Love Gun, kind of the early Kiss stuff. Um, the Knack, the Rolling Stones, which I discovered later in life. Uh, the Stones was my, my most recent. That was my lockdown discovery. But always, you know, my friends in high school, it was two crowds. It was the Judas Priest, the, the Sabbath crowd that I was in that was just beer drinkers. And then you had the other crowd that was you know, Dylan, the who Zeppelin, the stones, and they're all smoking weed. So it was like, I was never a part of that crowd, but all of a sudden I turned 54 and I'm a massive Jagger and stones. Fan. <laughs> but, uh, so I have this side that I've never put onto any annihilator CDs on purpose. Cause I thought it just didn't fit. I could put goofy stuff and extreme stuff on there, like classical and punk and jazz and blues, whatever little bits into heavy metal thrash metal but i always knew that if i had the chance there's something actually that i really wanted to do i think after about the fifth annihilator cd refresh the demon i could have quit and done this hard rock thing that i have done now that's the time i would have been very happy stopping but i kept going because i i loved it and and i wanted to sort of uh, defy the system i wanted to keep going to sort of survive it and uh, that was the thing. I wanted to get through those crappy times for metal, just survive it. And basically a middle finger to the where the business went. Um, and I did that. But in hindsight, I could have jumped ship uh, on my fifth album, went to this hard rock thing I love. But um, that was not popular then either. That was another form of music that was not interesting to people, most people, the mainstream. But this thing I got banned is... Um, I'd like to do it uh, the way it's being done is, I mean, it's been recorded in LA, Vancouver here. We've been right now. I'm just picking vocal takes right now on this screen in front of me. I've got these two touch screen things, so I don't have to get 10 or 90. So I'm editing with my hands here. Not, not the, uh, not the mouse, but um, I just, you know, everything's finished. There's some backup singers. There's some pianos. There's some soul singers coming on. There's a, this organ Hammond stuff. It's not heavy metal, and nobody's going to figure out I'm playing on it. So, oh, and nobody's going to figure out I wrote the entire thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's it's um it is not a project. I've literally dedicated my life to, besides from the anniversary touring and the Annihilator touring stuff. Um, this is going to be my life now. Next couple of records, I think. 
But uh, in spare note expense, it's like a. I went back to the, the sort of 80s budget, you know, when big budgets were thrown around. I hired a lot of the big people to work on the record. Um, you know, Mike Fraser, just a whole bunch of really badass people that were, some of them were even involved in some of these Van Halen and ACDC records. So I really got a, uh, and you know how when a lot of people get older, and I know this from, from, uh, from my age of 56, but the guys that are even older in the 60s are living, a lot of them are living off the reputations, what they did. A lot of them at, at 60, your ears cannot be functioning correctly at 60. Some of them, yes. Some of them who have take care, taken care of their hearing, played mixed at low volumes. But majority at 60, your ears are not going to be immaculate. Right? Um, what I did was I, I found a couple of people that I wanted to work on if I had my dream lineup for this record as far as the production staff. And I went for guys that still had it, that have incredible reputations, have done monster Van Halen records and just different records. And but been able to convince them that this isn't just uh, some project from some relatively unknown player and a project. This is more of a no, no, no. I'm I only want to hire you and pay you well if you're going to take this as serious as you took the other thing. So when I finally had those discussions. Which, believe it or not, most people, they're, they just laugh. They just kind of think, you know, it's, you know, if, if, say, Eddie Van Halen was alive or Malcolm Young was alive, and if they walked in for a potential meeting on a producer or an engineer, you would know that those people, staff, would be, well, partially kissing ass. They would be very polite. They would listen and they would want to get what the artist wants and they would take it as a very high level of quality work that they need to do. But you'd be amazed that even if you hire the top people, you'd be amazed at how many of them just actually slack off. Don't do a great job because you're not Eddie Van Hale. You're not Malcolm Young. You're not right. So I went through that for a while until I found the right people and I decided this is going to be either like one of the coolest records, guitar-based hard rock to come out that hasn't come out for many years, or it's going to totally suck. So well, let's see what happens. <laughs> but I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it right. It's going to be done with a top drummer, top engineers, studios, sound, and I'm writing the whole damn thing. So I, I'm the one that's going to take the, uh, and producing it, I'm the one that's going to take the fall, but I'm the one that's going to enjoy the riches if it, uh, gets appreciated. I think it will. I mean, if you like, I'll give you an example. If you like um, Diver Down album from Van Halen, you like Back in Black, and you like fucking Californian 1978 rock and roll with a, I don't know what to say, with a bit of stones in there. There you go. And it's um, and uh, totally an aside. Another thing. I've always... I've never bought Steel Panther records until like four or five years ago. And we all know Steel Panther. I mean, we, we, most of us, a lot of us know all the sides of Steel Panther and, and some sides we didn't want to know. Um, but um, we know that their image is fun. It's wigs. It's exciting, blah, 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 blah. And I know a lot of people know this too. But And that's their shtick. That's their gimmick. That's their thing. But... As many of us obviously know, their production and Satchel's guitar playing and Michael his singing, um, and on the records on a lot of those middle career earlier records, the production was phenomenal. The songwriting was incredible. It was like my God! It was like if you were going to go back and take the Scorpions and take Rat and take all that Van Halen, and you put that all together and you wanted to do it musically best of kind of record in the times today so to speak they nailed it they they obviously nailed it they just decided on that that image <laughs> that took them to a different place right i was thinking i don't want to be a steel panther without the the image and the wigs and the, i you know but in a way there's something about that where i would like to have parts of that and those are the the seriously produced well written, well performed stuff that Satchel and Michael were doing, that the guys were doing, um, but with 
less of a intentional pull from that stuff and more of a hard rock thing rather than the heavy metal stuff. Less of the rat and the scorpions and more of the, the hard rock stuff. So that's kind of my dream. And I finally got made it come true. So I'll shut up now, but watch <laughs> out for it because I'm not going to let you know that it's out. It's going to be coming out hopefully without uh, anybody knowing that I have anything to do with it. That's my intention. So I'm going to fool. I'm going to fool everybody. So you're not going to. You, you're not going to tell me what the name of the band is. No, no. I'm just going to let it come out. And if it, if people hear about it, great. If people think it's fucking amazing, then I win. And if people don't like it, well then, ah, I tried and I got it out of my system. Well, Jeff, that's all I got for you today. I really <laughs> appreciate your honesty on the business. I have to say nobody talks about it like you did. Oh, cool. And well, uh, you know why? You know why? Because I don't give a fuck anymore. That's why. <laughs> I seriously, look, I, I don't give a fuck. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing it because I, like, I'm just doing this press stuff for that label that was kind enough to pay some good money for the catalog. And they asked me for a favor. And it's also stuff I did in the past. So it'd be nice if I helped them out and, and talked about it. But I told them, actually, said, no more, no more press. I mean, actually, you're the third last interview. Uh, I said, no more press. I've, I've got a, I've got a, a new record, a new band. I, I'm, I'm moving on. And that's the thing. Um, it's nice to be at a spot when you're 56 years old and you're totally excited about music and doing something different, but realizing that the fact that you're, you made it this far with a heavy metal band called Annihilator and you have so many, I'd say underground fans, but, but faithful fans and playing these shows that we get to play in tours. It's like, I know I'm the luckiest kid in the world from Canada that's played in the heavy metal business. Absolutely. Like, clearly, even historically, I'm the luckiest dude from there. I, I wouldn't call Rush heavy metal because I would say those guys are, you know, you know what I mean? Triumph and all those great bands. But anyway, I could talk forever and you know it. And uh, maybe we'll talk again about my non heavy metal project someday. Absolutely, because it's been too long. The last time I talked to you was 2005 during the Schizoid Deluxe uh, Junket. Wow. wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, well, have, well, next time you have a sip of whiskey, think about me dreaming for a sip of rum, but not having one. Yeah, there you go. You, hey, I got a whiskey. I got a whiskey that's bourbon and rum. Oh, where was I? Where were you 22 years ago? <laughs> All right, Jeff, yeah. I really appreciate it. I wish you the best of luck on everything. and. Um, the new album by Annihilator is Metal 2. It's out now, and you got more on the way. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> See you later. Good luck, man. Take care. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.